So what is true worship all about? And we ask the question because what we after is loving God. Is there anybody in the house that wants to love God? Yes, we all want to love God. If you, if you want to love God, shout Amen. If you're happy and you know it, shout Amen. If you're happy and you know it, stamp your feet. If you're happy and you know it, and you really want to show it, if you're happy and you know it, shout, I love God, <laughs> and give him a big praise. <laughs> okay, so, so what, is, uh, what does it mean to love God? It means that you live a lifestyle of worship. And I want us to start this morning with this simple definition of worship. And this may be a simple definition, but it touch on the different aspects of true worship. If you want to know what true Christian worship is all about, here we go. This is true Christian worship. True Christian worship is a lifestyle of intimacy with God. What we've experienced in the worship here this morning, that is, that's, that's, that is intimacy with God. That is how intimacy with God looks like. And, and that's only the beginning because there are levels, there are dimensions of that kind of intimacy. So true Christian worship is a lifestyle of intimacy with God. In other words, there's a, com a continuous awareness of the presence and the glory of God and that we are carriers of that glory. And that leads to obedience to His will and loving others as the Holy Spirit guides us. In other words, true worship never ends with intimacy, but it flows over into a lifestyle of doing the will of God, of obeying the will of God, and it will always include loving others. And I'm going to prove that to you here this morning. And then this definition says that worship is the foundation of our purpose in life. That's why we exist. We exist to worship. Whatever you do, whatever plan you have, wherever you are in your life, if you want to know what your, worship, what your purpose is, your purpose is to worship God, to worship Him through your family, worship Him through your business, worship Him through your career, worship Him uh, through whatever uh, that you are doing. There you worship God. So, but the purpose remains the same. It's, the, it's to worship God. And, um, and then I've said, you were created by God for God. So if you want to know anything about worship, that is it. Have to understand that to be able to understand the true meaning of of worship. And so today I want to I want us to focus on this as this one aspect of this definition, loving others, because loving God also means loving others. And I want to show you today that loving God and loving people are connected. Say this with me: loving God and loving people are connected. They are intertwined. I like that word. It sounds like ch 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 chewing gum, intertwined. <laughs> they are, you cannot separate that. So in other words, to make it simple, you can't say, I love God, but you don't love people. You can't stand here in church, lift your hands and be all holy. <laughs> I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. And then you get outside, you know, and uh, you, you don't have compassion for people. You, you mistreat people, you know, uh, stuff like that. Amen. <laughs> Show me how you treat people. Show me how much you care for people. And I will tell you if you're a worshiper. Is it going to be quiet in this church? <laughs> I say, show me how you care for people, how you treat people. And I will show you if you love God. Say this with me, the way I treat people shows, reveals if I really love God. So I want to talk to you about worship that loves people. And you will see that part of the work of worship, because last week we spoke about worship that works, amen. Part of that work is to love people. Part of that work is to, what is the great commandment? Love the Lord your God. Everybody, anyone anyone in, the, in the house of God that wants to love God? Yes, we, I, believe, I believe we all want to love God. So what's the great commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, strength, soul. And secondly, but, you see, this is what we, what we forget. And equal 
Say with me, equal now. Secondly and equal. Just as important in other words. I'm quoting the great commandment to you. Is to do what? Is to love neighbor. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, don't you worry about a thing? I love you just as much as I love myself. And you know this is true. Because you can see it. You, in, in the way I care for you, how I call you in the week, how I support you. You know, when you go through a tough time, how I'm there for you. You, you, you know it's true. Come on. I mean, I've proven myself to you, haven't I? Now it grows quiet in this house. <laughs> So uh, let's talk real Christianity. You want to talk real Christianity? Then, then, then talk about how you treat people. Talk about how you love people and how serious you are. That's real Christianity. We don't move beyond that point. I'm sorry you don't get past that point. Listen to the words of John in 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. If someone says, <laughs> look at this, if someone says, I love God, before we continue the reading, is there anybody here that loves God? Come on, raise your hand. Tell your neighbor, I love God. Okay, look at this. If someone says, you've said it, I love God, but hates a fellow believer, that person is a liar. Somebody go, ouch. Enough. Yeah. You're lying. I've learned, I'm sorry to say this, but I've learned that Christians can lie. Believers can lie. I've seen men of God lying, I'm telling you. We can lie. <laughs> he says, so if you, if you say you love God, but you, you mistreat others, you're a liar. He says, for, listen now, for if we don't love people, and, and he's making an argument, he's proving something. He says, for if you don't love people who you can see, how can you love God whom you cannot see? In other words, you lift your hands and say, I love you, Lord, and we come to church and we're Christians, you know, and, and, and if anybody asks you, do you love God? You say, yes, I do love God. He says, but, but how is it then that you are mistreating people, that you're not having compassion for people? He says, because it's impossible to say that you love God, whom you cannot see, by the way. But the person who's in front of you, you don't love that person, you mistreat that person, you don't do justice to that person, you don't support that person, you don't help somebody when the opportunity presents itself. He says, you are lying, it's not true, you are not a worshiper, you're not loving God, because you cannot even love those who you can see. Is that what the Bible says? So then why are you taking offense and say you don't like me, because I preach this radical stuff to you? Just joking, I trust everybody understands this is the word of God. <laughs> and, and, and you know, I've, I've learned if you talk about true worship, that's stuff preaching. People like prosperity messages. Oh, pastor, when are we going to get one on hope? <laughs> I want to be edified. But I'll tell you, nothing will edify you more than you turning into a true worshiper. Because there's no greater joy than to love God and to worship God with everything that you are. And loving people and see the blessing and the hand of God on every area and part of your life. There's nothing greater than that. It begins with worship. It's your purpose. It's my purpose. And this is why you will see. And so what if I, you know, what's the point we're making? The point is that. Um, loving God and loving people are connected. And even in the story from Solomon, and I mentioned this story because last week we saw how David instructed him to, um, to, to, to learn how to be intimate with God. And then he said, now I want you to do the work. And we've said that, you know, worship begins with intimacy and then it flows over in obeying God and doing the work of God uh, within our lives, whatever that involves. And, and I, and I want to show you the example of Solomon Part of that worship that works then flowed over into loving people. Because listen to 2 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 11. The word of God says, God said to Solomon, because your greatest desire is to help your people. In other words, Solomon prayed, prayed, prayed. He learned intimacy with God. He worshipped God like we've done here this morning. And then he began to build the temple. He did the work. He, he fulfilled the calling of God on his life. 
um, and he prayed, prayed. He said, Lord, and he prayed many times. In, in, in one place, he offered a thousand offerings. That's how much he prayed. That's how serious he took the command of his dad to be intimate with God. And then at a certain point in time, God says, okay, now ask what you want. And he says, I, I want wisdom. God says, wow, Solomon, your heart has changed. Because you're not asking something for yourself. That's the problem with many, many believers today. We're always asking only something for ourselves. God says, but Solomon, now you're asking for the people. Now you're loving the people. He says, because your greatest desire is to help people, now ask what you want. He says, I will give you even what you've asked, wisdom, and I'll ask you everything else. What did Jesus say in Matthew 6, verse 33? He says, seek your first and its righteousness. And all things shall be added. So where's the focus? True worship aligns our hearts. It positions us to focus where we need to focus. Amen. We need to focus on God. And then we need to do what God has called us to do. And that includes loving people. Amen. Are you ready to love people? Now I want us to just talk about what that means. I mean we can say that. But what does that mean? And I think a good place to start is to look at a few characteristics of love because when we talk about the love of God, where we unselfishly love people, because that's worship, that's what it means to love God, then that also speaks about a very specific love, which is called the agape love. And you get a lot of agape preaching in the month of February because Valentine's Day is in there. I've seen another place where people uh, like to talk about agape love, and that's at, at marriage uh, w uh, w wedding ceremonies. You know, they, we be big on preaching on this po portion of Scripture when, when people are getting married. But you see, this is a, this is a passage of Scripture, in, in f and I'm referring to 1 Cor uh, Cor Corinthians chapter 13. That's a passage of Scripture that you and I must measure our lives with it must become a measuring yard it must that's how we measure if we possess the kind of love that we truly love others that we're not just fooling ourselves saying we love people because this is how that kind of love looks like do you want to see that by the way you get different many different kinds of love you get eros love, which is the romantic love between one man and one woman. And the context for that kind of love, there's only one context, and that's marriage, the covenant of marriage. Um, then there's a phileo love, which is a friendship love, like David and Jonathan. And then there is also the storge love, that's the family love, the love you have for your, your, your family. Um, and then there's the agape love. And, and the point I'm making is that none of these loves come to their full rights and reach their potential if we are not filled with the agape love of God. Because that's the supernatural love of God. By the way, John said that God is love. So when you're filled with love, you're filled with God. And that's why you cannot separate loving God and loving people. God is love. Now God says, I want you to love me back, which means you will also love others. Some people think, you know, as long as I love God, I've got my vertical relationship with God going, then how, how I treat my horizontal relationships doesn't mean, it doesn't matter so much. You are in error. <laughs> they are the same. They are connected. They're intertwined. Show me how you treat people. I'll tell you if you're a worshiper. Lifting your hands in church doesn't make you a worshiper, although it's very important. Okay, let's look at agape characteristics. Why are you so quiet this morning? I think we must now get to another sermon series so that you can get excited about the preaching again. <laughs> but you need to hear this, amen? You need to hear this. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3 to 7 says, If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love... Come on, say that word. So let me ask you this. Is your wife others? I hope not. <laughs> She's not others. You are one with your spouse. Is your children others? I pray to the Lord that you don't view your children as others. No, they are your family. They are your blood. <laughs> so was he talking about your family? Yeah, no. He talked about... 
what Jesus talked about, loving neighbor. So who's neighbor? That's the question. Will you agree we have to answer that? Who's neighbor then? Okay. And, and by the way, so obviously love starts with your family. It, uh, charity starts at home. Uh, but I often ask this question, why, why, why does anyone ha- have to, re- has to remind you, you know, that charity starts at home? If you're a born-again child of God, you should have known that a very long time ago and got it covered. So please, let's not talk about that. Otherwise, something is wrong, okay? <laughs> you need Jesus. <laughs> so here's the point. Let's look at what this kind of love looks like. He says, if I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, here's the problem. He says, I would have gained nothing. Get this, church. You can, you can offer your body to be, you, to, to be burnt. You can say, well, I will die for people. I will actually kill you and because you know, you've said they could. Um, you could give everything you have to the poor. So now, it doesn't mean that you love people. Why not? Because your motive is, your motive is it's all about you and what I can do. We have got a lot of organizations like that in our day and time where, you know, there's a, there's a, they're helping people, but the motive, the motive is not right, whatever that motive is. You can do all these things, but if the motive is not the agape love of God for humanity, then it doesn't mean anything. And, and don't get me wrong, God will use all these organizations and even people to meet certain needs. He will use it any way he can. That doesn't mean the person that's doing it is loving people. Can I get an amen there? That's a revelation for some of us. He says in verse 4, so now, now he speaks about love. Let's look at this. He says, love is patient and kind. Uh-oh, patient, kind. So remember, we're talking about how can you say that you love God, but you don't love people, you mistreat people. Now he says, this is what this kind of love looks like that you use to love people. He says, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud. So where there's pride, there's a problem. We spoke, uh, by the way, we've had an awesome men's fellowship here yesterday morning where we had like uh, uh, 40 men and we've prayed for families, we've prayed for the city, we've prayed for the church, we've prayed for the nation, for the elections. And I want to thank all the guys, 7 o'clock at a Saturday morning who came out. And we had some Buddhavors and it was awesome. Come on, all the men shout hoo-ha. <laughs> And, um, and, 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 and the message was humility. The message was humility. There's no room for pride. And unfortunately, you know, I, I can't say more about that today because of time. But he says, love does not contain pride. It's not proud. It's not rude. Love is patient and kind. Yeah, sorry. Um, it does not demand its own way. It's not forcing its way through life forcing i'm not forcing you i'm not manipulating you by the way if we have to force and manipulate people to get them to be and to do what we want them to to to, to be and do that's witchcraft that's how that is the foundation of how manipulation and control that's the foundation of witchcraft and i've seen that even in the church it's sad but i can tell you you can see it in many churches he says so it doesn't demand its own way it's not irritable when the, when the going gets tough, the tough gets going, and then the tough often gets irritable and frustrated. <laughs> God says, no, it's not irritable. And it keeps no record of being wronged. It doesn't walk around with a la- little black book. I said to my, um, to my mother-in-law, um, oh, she's sitting there this morning when she came in, uh, uh, she, she, they were, she just made it, but in my books, they were a little bit late. I said to her, I, I, I'm walking around here in the parking lot with my little black book, <laughs> writing down the names of those who are late. Okay, so, but it, the, the, sorry, mom, for that. I, I apologize because the Bible says it doesn't keep record of being wrong, so I apologize. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. But I'm only saying this because she's my mother-in-law. For the rest of you guys, I will write down your name, okay? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so look at this. This is love. We're talking about love, the kind of love we need to have for people. So it doesn't rejoice about injustice. It can never rejoice uh, uh, about any injustice that's going on or any inequalities. It cannot. It looks for righteousness. It looks for justice. It looks for equality. That's what love does, okay? 
um, and, and, and rejoice whenever the truth wins out. <sighs> How many of you say, Lord, fill my heart with this love? Fill my heart with the agape love. Fill me, fill me, fill me. Fill me, that's what the world needs. It's the love of God. It says love never gives up. It never gives up on people. It's talking about your love for people. It never gives up on people. Um, it never loses faith. It's always hopeful and uh, endures through every circumstance. It endures through every circumstance. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, this is the kind of love we need to have for others. Say with me, others. Beyond our own families and our own context, for others, neighbor. So the question is, who's your neighbor? Because your neighbor is the person that you need to, to love with this kind of love. And when you do, you worship God. You love God. Do you get this? This is beautiful stuff here. Yeah? Amen. I think it's awesome. I think it's so powerful. I think it's, it's what we need for the revolution we need is this love revelation. So who's your neighbor? And the, the, the answer comes when a, a teacher of religious law asked Jesus about the commandment. Jesus then comes, he says, and I don't know why everybody always wanted to know what, about the commandment. I believe it's because people want to be purposeful and they, they want to make heaven. So this teacher of religious law comes to Jesus. He was a teacher of religious law. Any teachers in the house? Okay. Ja, kom aan, Sean, steek op jou hand. Ik weet jy, leer mense. <laughs> okay, any teachers. Okay, so he comes, he says, Jesus, talk to us about the great commandment. Jesus says, that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind. We know it by now. He says, and equally that you love neighbor as yourself. And Jesus is done. He answered this person. But this person knew he was not loving people, so he wanted to justify himself and ask, but who then is my neighbor? Who's my neighbor? You see, here's the thing. We want to love who we want to love. It's easy to love certain people, isn't it? It's easy to love your favorite person. <laughs> That's easy. But Jesus didn't say, love the Lord your God with all your heart and your favorite person as you love yourself. Did he say that? No. He says, neighbor. And then Jesus told him the story of the Good Samaritan. He says, let me answer you. And we all know the story, the story of the Good Samaritan. A Jewish guy got beat up and robbed and left at the side of the road that went to Jericho to bleed out and to die there on the side, the Jewish person. Here comes the church. Why do I say church? Because the Bible says a priest had come along and ignored him. I'm telling you, there are Christians and churches that are in ignoring people. Jesus said it. The priest ignores him. The pastor doesn't pay attention. May the Lord help me. And that I will not be that kind of pastor. Uh, the worship leader comes. And I know it's not like, Pastor Carl is not anything like that worship leader. But how do I know it was a worship leader? Because the Bible says a Levite came. And they were the... Um, the, the tribe that did the worship. So the worship team came. They sang, I love you, Lord, every Sunday, leading the people into that, but they don't love the Jewish person. And it's one of their own. It's one of their own, okay? They don't love him. They sing it. They lead the worship, but they don't love. Read to me, don't worry. I know you're not like that. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, now look at this. Here Jesus comes, he selects a Samaritan. A Samaritan um, is a person from a different race, and the Jewish people and the Samaritans, they can't stand each other. Have you ever thought about this? Why is Jesus selecting for his story? He's making the Samaritan person the hero of his story. And he knows that the Jewish people can't stand him. But this Samaritan becomes the, the hero of his story, he becomes the good Samaritan. And what does he do? He stops. He sees a person from another race. And I believe it's special when we can reach beyond man-made boundaries and differences when it comes to race, to love beyond our race. I believe there's a special blessing there. And it's part of the solution for our country, South Africa. Churches like this is part of the solution. 
I believe in my heart that we can no longer be exclusive. We need to find ways, cultures, create such a culture, be intentional in it so that everybody from different races and nations and languages can all serve God together. That's working towards a solution for our country. I'm convinced in my spirit. When I look at the Bible, I see it everywhere. Okay. So, um, so the point is the Samaritan comes and he reaches beyond that, that border, that class, class classification. He's now loving somebody that's not maybe easy to love. <laughs> he is now reaching out to his neighbor. Jesus is answering the story of loving your neighbor. He stops, he pours out oil and wine, medicine for the day. He treats him. He says he, he, he saw he needs more treatment. He took him to the, take, takes him to the hospital. Um, they, they took care of him. He says, don't worry, I'll pay the bill. Loving your neighbor will cost you time, effort, money, resources. I'm asking us as a church, and I, I don't speak down on you, I include myself. Do we love neighbor? If we don't, we, 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 we're not loving God the way we're supposed to, to, to love God. And listen, I'm not saying you don't have a relationship with God, but the, the context is we ask the question, do we love God? And do we want to hear the truth about loving God? Then we have to look at the Good Samaritan. We have to define neighbor. He's the one who took care. That's your neighbor. Others. Say with me, others. My neighbor. Let's not be selective about who we want to love. Let's use any opportunity. When the opportunity presents itself, and God may even send somebody from a different race, a different skin color, a different language. Uh, just for, 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 my, you know, for myself, whenever I get the opportunity, I am even more friendly and open with people of other races because I know of the stigma in our country of, of apartheid and racism and stuff like that. And so, um, and so we don't want to get into that, but here is what we can do is the church. We can love beyond that, that, that man-made thing. And I, I, and, I, and I do my best to make people from other colors and nations, because in our country we've got them all now. It's not just black. Uh, if you're a white person, it's brown. It's, um, I almost said yellow. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's Indian. It's colored. It's Japanese. It's, we have them all. Show, make, make a special, be, be more intentional reaching out. Because God has a plan for that purpose life. He's a creation in the image and likeness of God. Jesus came, go read Revelation 5, for every tribe, every color, every nation, the blood of Jesus was shed. Hallelujah. And, and this is what racism means. Racism means that one class thinks that they are superior to another. It's about being superior. God, there's no superior class in the eyes of God. No, nothing. Go read your Bible. Go read Acts 10, if you're still in question. Acts 10, the story of Cornelius and Peter. There are many stories, by the way. The Good Samaritan is another story. And here's the problem. And Paul said it to Timothy. The last day church will be a loveless church. In the last day church, people will grow to become more narcissistic. In, in, in the last days, people will be turned from where they were supposed to love others, to, to narcissists, where everything is just about themselves. Look at the scripture um, from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. You should know this, Timothy, listen now, that in the last days there will be difficult. Why will there be difficult times? Another translation says there will be per perilous times. It says they will be unloving. That's why... That's why things will be the way they are. Because people will be unloving and even unforgiving. They will be puffed up with pride. In other words, there will be no humiliation. They will only love pleasure rather than love God. And, you know, I didn't put in the whole scripture there, but they, the, the Bible says they will be boastful. And they will be prideful. And they will boast about who they are and what they have. And... and, and 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. If you want to know a biblical definition of a narcissist, go just read, just read that passage. That is a biblical definition of a narcissist. 
And listen, you can be a Christian and a narcissist in your own eyes. You can think you're a religious person and a Christian. Because look at this, verse 5 says, They will act religious. <laughs> they will clap, they will sing. <laughs> they will act religious. We know, how to, we know what to say, what to do. So, will you agree from verse 5 that Paul was not talking? He wasn't talking to unbelievers, he was talking to believers. He was talking to the end time church. He says they will act religious. They know all what to do. They, they, they know what to do when it comes to religion. And, but they reject the power that could make them godly. At this church, they're rejecting the Holy Spirit. The very thing I talked about you in worship this morning, you know, where we need to open our hearts and lives for the Holy Spirit. This generation, this loveless church, this loveless generation, this unloving generation, what will they do? They will deny the power of the Holy Spirit. They don't know the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's too weird for them. They deny the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. Revelation 2 verse 4 to 5. But I have this complaint against you. Jesus is talking to who? John. John, the disciple who laid with his head against the chest of Jesus. He says, Jesus said, reveals this to John. He says, John, go and tell the church of Ephesus. This is the church of Ephesus. He says, go tell the church of Ephesus, I have a complaint against you. What is my complaint? What is Jesus' complaint against this church? Not this church. <laughs> the church of Ephesus. Amen. Look at somebody sitting next to you. He's not talking about this church. He's talking about another church. <laughs> As a matter of fact, this whole message is not for you, this church. It's just for you to take note that there are Christians like that in some other churches far from here. <laughs> okay. He says, I have this complaint. This is Jesus talking. He says, you don't love me or each other as you did at first. Can you see once again loving God and loving people are connected, intertwined? He says, I you don't love me or each other as you did at first. In other words, you've stopped to love me. You've stopped to worship me. You can no longer say that you love me because you don't. And you don't even love one another. I've shown you this morning, I set out to prove this, that loving God and loving people are connected. I've proven to you this morning through the Bible who your neighbor is and what that kind of love is that God has deposited within us that we need to love people with. And therefore, he says, now look how far you have fallen. And therefore, this morning, I know this is a tough message because I believe it, um, it brings us to a place of self-evaluation. And isn't that what church is all about? You, 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 don't want to be, you don't want to be soothed in your ears and think that everything is okay and never come to a place where we do self-evaluation and say, Lord, help me, help me to love people. Help me to love others. And I think it will be grossly ignorant if we don't ask the question, then how can I do that? How many of you want to know how you can love people? <laughs> can I give you five points how to love people? And I will show them to you from the Good Samaritan. I just want to share the scripture. And we're going to end with this. Matthew 9, verse 36 to 38. Look at this. And this is again Jesus looking over the crowds. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on others, on the people of the crowds. So he loved them. And this word compassion means that you want to alleviate, you want to ease their pain, their suffering. That's compassion because, because of the love you have for people. He says, so, um, so when he saw them, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is great. Listen to me, church, the harvest is great. There's only one reason the harvest is not coming in, and that is because we're not loving as much as we're supposed to love. You know, they are, it's, they are, it's directly proportional. The proportion of people that's coming in, the harvest that's coming in, is equivalent to, to our love for people. The harvest will not come in if we don't love the people. So Jesus said, the harvest is great. Say with me, the harvest is great. 
So churches should not be empty. There should not be empty spaces in churches. The harvest is great. This is Jesus talking. He says the harvest is great, but here's the problem. Workers. <laughs> then to somebody sitting next to you, tell them, are you, ask them, are you a worker? <laughs> okay. Maybe just smile at somebody. Don't, don't ask them because we, we don't want to. Just smile at somebody. I like this. Scratch your head. Am I a worker? <laughs> what did we say last week? Go listen to last week's message again. Worship that works. Solomon, I will give you everything you want because your desire is to help the people now. The good Samaritan, you are the hero of my story because you're the one who does the work. Loving others. As long as we have empty seats and this morning we don't have that many, thank God. <laughs> it looks better. <laughs> But never ever forget that the empty seat means that there's work to be done. And an empty seat also asks the question, do we love as we're supposed to love? Amen? Ouch. I don't believe this. Okay? <laughs> you decide. It's up to you. <laughs> yes, pastor. No, pastor. Or I don't know what to say, pastor. <laughs> so, so I pray to the Lord. So, he, so Jesus then tells us to do two things. He says, so pray to God who is in charge of the harvesters to ask him to send more workers. Listen to this. He doesn't pray for the harvest and the sheep. He doesn't say, Father, I pray that you will help these lost sheep who are hurting. I pray for them. Oh, karaba shababa, Lord, that your love will come upon them. And he starts doing, you know, this intercession prayer. He doesn't do that. What does he do? is you need more workers. You need to structure yourself. Pray for leaders. Pray for people who will love others. And ask then, and so pray to the Lord who's in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers in the field. And right after that, Jesus did a second thing because Matthew 10 verse 1 is right after that. Jesus called his disciples. He says, and, and then he gave them authority. What did he do? He mobilized them. He says, now go love. Can I mobilize you this morning? Just for a moment, see the harvest of our city, the, the unsaved family, children, co-workers, colleagues, schools, universities. See the Vault Triangle. See all the lost people. By the way, you know, in the Vault Triangle, there's like, I think, 1.2 million people. Just here, here in our close suburb, Funnabel Park, you talk about 100,000 people. Um, just in our surrounding. If you, if you just look across the street here, you see 50,000 people in the township here. Just across from us. Hundreds and thousands of people everywhere we go. The harvest is great. But we need people who love others. We need people who love others. I, I, I plead with the church this morning, let's begin to love people. Amen. So I ask you, can, can I show you how to love them? Mag ek jou wees? Gee my a paar minute, give me a few minutes. Just five things here. Buy out the time and to go out of your way. If you're going to love people, you need to buy out time. And go out of your way. The good Samaritan went out of his way. The good Samaritan was also on his way to Jericho. But he got interrupted because a person was bleeding and dying. And you know if we can maybe uh, draw a parallel from that. He was probably on his way to hell. He needed Jesus. But for that to take place. Somebody would stop with all their busyness for a moment. Buy out the time. And be willing to help. Go out of your way to meet a need. Whenever an opportunity presents itself where it's about others, stop. Buy out the time. Address the need. People are more important than all our busyness. And I, I understand how business works. I understand corporate. I come from an environment. I understand all that stuff. But our first responsibility is to love God. We cannot love God if we don't love people. Buy out the time. 
Loving people will cost you time. It will cost you to stop sometimes with what you're busy. It will cost you to prioritize what's really important. Can't take anything to heaven but people. But people meet a need. The Good Samaritan had met the need. This person was bleeding and dying. Bleeding and dying speaks of, uh, it speaks of a spiritually uh, or symbolically of the condition of people that you surround you. They are in pain. They are bleeding. They are dying. They need restoration. They need deliverance. They need to give their hearts and lives to Jesus. There's chaos in their lives. Do you know how many broken homes we have in, in our city? Where the children are not loved by the fathers. Where the mother are not, is not there anymore. Where there's no loving the children. Where there's chaos. There's brokenness. There's brokenness. We are called to meet that need as a church, as people. And listen, God will place one person in your life. Maybe a co-worker. Maybe the lady that's helping you in the home. Maybe anyone. Say with me, I must meet a need. A need will open the door for you to witness to somebody about the love of Jesus. Number three, and that's what the Good Samaritan did. He, he met all the net needs of that person, and he paid for everything. I say he paid. He paid. Loving people cost you time and money. I don't care who you are. There's no way around it's going to cost you. Raise your hand if you want to love God. <laughs> we've, got a, we've got a few lesser hands now. I, I don't know if I'm counting wrong. <laughs> I asked you, do you want to hear the truth? I've asked you. You said, yes. Hallelujah. <laughs> Number three, get over past disappointments. I've said this to you. The Samaritan was rejected by the Jewish people because the Jewish people thought that they were superior to the Samaritans. So the Samaritans was hurt, emotionally abused by the Jewish people. The Samaritan had to get over his hurts and his pains that this race or nation had for them and said, I'll still help you. If you're going to say, well, I don't trust people, I'm not going to help people, you know, people will just disappoint you. Yes, you are probably right, but that should not stop any one of us to help people, to love people, to do our best for people. And it's something I've learned a long time in ministry, you know, because when you're in ministry, you get disappointed. Really, because ministry says you're all called for people. So I just want to say to the young people here that says, I want to be a pastor, I want to be a pastor, and believe me, we've got a number of them in this house. Thank God. I want to warn you, people are going to disappoint and hurt and reject and do whatever against you. Please get over yourself, not about you. Don't think like a narcissist. Marisa, this is maybe too radical. <laughs> well, as I said, it's not for you. I'm just mentioning this so that you know that there are Christians like that in some other churches. Then to somebody said, it's time to get over your disappointments with people. You've got to love people again. Don't, don't go back to that little black book of yours, please. Stop doing that. In the name of Jesus, I... Wipe out your black book. I declare destruction over your black book. It's time to forgive people. They've hurt you. They've abused you. And by the way, have you not also hurt people? Yes, I've hurt people. Yes, I'll be the first. I've handled situations wrong. How many of you can say that with me this morning? You see, when we look at our own hurt, you know, and how people against us, against us, but we never talk about what we do. It's like talking about worship, you know, that ends with intimacy. But we never talk about worship that continues in obeying and loving others. <laughs> you have to preach the whole Bible. So what about what you and I have done against people? Because we're not perfect. We've made mistakes. It hurt people. Uh, a, f a few years ago, I had a person who came from our childhood. You know, he was dating my sister and stuff like that. You know, and I was a young person. I didn't care about their dating. And so he came to me after many years, I think two decades. He said, I want to see you. And I often greet him and we're friendly because you once dated my sister. He says, I want to see you. I said, oh, oh okay, that sounds serious. He, he meets me at Wimpy. He's, you know, he, he buys the coffee. He says, I forgive you. I said, okay, <laughs> that's fine. You can forgive me. What have I done? He says, you've never greeted me. I felt rejected. I never felt good enough for your sister. I didn't even know, you know, that I was 
hurting this person, rejecting this person. Now that I'm older and wiser, I would have probably handling this whole dating my sister scenario a little bit different, but there's no textbook for that when you're a young person. You haven't done that before. You see, so sometimes just because we are young, we make mistakes, but it doesn't mean that it does not hurt people. We've made mistakes. We have to love again. Some people say, I'll never trust people again. Well, then you'll never be able to love God again. Don't be picky. There's no preferences when it comes to people. Whether they're white or brown, whatever nation, let's love people. Let's break the back of racism. Let's break racism. Let's get done with racism. Racism is a demonic spirit that destroys relationships. It's evil. It's demonic. Let's break it. Let's be intentional in coming against the spirit in the name of Jesus. You've tried. <laughs> You've tried. Well done. You've tried. Thank you, Jesus. Let's finish. Be intentional to witness. John 3.16, for God so that he, let's stop for God so agape, the world, people. What did he do? That he, loving is giving, cost you time and money. Why did he do that? So that? Let's look at the main purpose why God gave Jesus. So that whoever believes in him shall not. Let's stop, stop there. What does it mean to perish? In, in the context of John 3. It means that people will not end up in hell. That's what it means to perish. Don't let this generation with its new theology and new age, you know, want to change the Bible, rewrite the Bible with their new age mentality, tell you there's no such thing as heaven and hell. God gave Jesus so that we will not perish, that we will not go to hell. But if we believe in Jesus, we will be saved. Your name will be written in heaven's book of life. Hallelujah. And that is where our love for people starts because that's where God's love for mankind started. Are you with me, people? Listen, there's no way you can get around it. At a certain point, you will have to ask people, do you know Jesus? And in our South African context, they'll probably tell you, yes, I know him. And then ask them, but where's your church? Because here's the thing, the church is the body of Jesus Christ. And God plants people in the church. Go read Acts. As, as, as the people gave their hearts and lives to Jesus, they were planted in the church. Planted in the church. Ultimately, people need to be planted in the church. Planted in the church. Because the church is the place where we get edified. The church is the place where we get corrected. The church is the place where we get saved. The church is the place where we get baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit. The church is the place where God gives us vision, where we corporately pray and worship. And this body of believers protects your salvation. It helps you not to, back, uh, to backslide. And there are many other reasons. I mean, we can preach about the ecclesia for many weeks. We don't have the time to do that. But listen, there's no way we can get a, around witnessing. And therefore, I want you to witness. I mobilize you. In the name of Jesus, now go and love the world around you. If you receive it, say amen. And let's stand to our feet. And when we stand to our feet, let's give Jesus a big praise in this house. <laughs> Shout, hallelujah. <laughs> Turn to somebody and tell them, well, that was tough. But you know, I probably had to hear that. Yes, there's no such thing as loving God, but we're playing around. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. The price Jesus paid was too big for us. It was too big. It's time to love. Can't lie, be liars anymore. And therefore, I want to encourage you. When is our Passover conference? Good Friday, the 29th of March. Amen. Say with me, Good Friday. Pastor Carl said it last week. He said, nobody is allowed to go on holiday. Because <laughs> and, and he spoke about those people going to Margate over that long weekend. So you must cancel those plans. <laughs> don't worry. Okay, don't worry. Um, don't worry. The point I'm making is, Let's love people. Let's invite people. Empty chairs means that we still need to love more. Let's invite people. 
Let's try again. Let's not be disappointed about what happened if we have tried it, but it didn't work. And really, people, I don't want anybody to take offense here this morning. It's easy to hear this word, and sometimes we need to line up what we think Christianity and my relationship with God's all about, and just get to a place where we line it up with the truth of the Bible. And some of that happened here today. So if you felt a little uncomfortable, I want you to know why. Sometimes our truth has just to be just needs to be purified a little bit. But let's stick to the truth. We cannot say we love God, but we don't love people. Listen, let's make the time. Let's meet the need. Let's get over our disappointment. Let's do whatever it takes. Let's witness. Let's reach. Let's love beyond boundaries. Sometimes those boundaries are not, are not skin color, but they are class. They are class. I'm, I'm not going to talk to this person. He's my boss. She's my boss. They can be class. I, I feel inferior to speak to these people about Jesus because they got more money than, than I have. The devil is lying to you. They need Jesus. It's witness. And I want to encourage you. Let's invite somebody. For church, every Sunday, those of you part of cell, bring them into the cell system. Let's pray at our prayer meetings. Let's do whatever we can to love others because we cannot lie anymore about this. There's no such thing as loving God, but we don't love people. And loving people is intentional business every day. And when we're intentional, God will bring the opportunity. You are an awesome church, amen. God loves you. You're going places, hallelujah. God's going to reveal himself to you. God's going to open doors. I speak open heavens over every heart and life here this morning. God's going to change your, 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 your family. God's going to transform your heart. God's going to do great things at your workplace, at your school, at your university. The Spirit of God is moving like He's never moved before. I prophesy it over you in Jesus' name. Father, I pray for this people this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Help us to be a people who truly loves you. Worship that begins with intimacy, but then obeys and love others. Give you praise. If there's any person in this place this morning, and you're uncertain about your life with Jesus. You say, I need Jesus. Pastor, I've sinned. I've made a few mistakes. I've, I'm not sure if my name's written in heaven's book of life. I just want to surrender and be sure. I don't know why you're unsure, but maybe you're unsure. And maybe you've never given your heart and life to Jesus. You've never taken a moment like this serious. You have done it before, but you weren't serious before. But this morning you realize you need to repent. You need a 180 degree turnaround. If that's you, quickly right there where you are, raise your hand that God will save you and touch you and fill you with his purpose. If that is you, just, uh, if you can just raise your hand. If you can just raise your hand if there's any person. Just pray this prayer after me. Say, Father, I surrender to you. I believe in my heart. I confess with my mouth. Jesus is Lord. I pray, help me to love you. Help me to understand worship. I pray this morning, fill my heart right now with a love for people. Your love. Use me. I make myself available. Show me those that are bleeding and dying at the Jericho Road. Help me to be instrumental in their salvation. In Jesus' name. Amen. Give Jesus a big praise. Hallelujah.